Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. Sunshine. Chapter 11. Silence fell. Some things hadn't changed. Bo is looking for me, I said at last. Yes, he said. I'm sorry, I said humbly, I don't know what to do. I, I, all I did was drive out to the lake, that night, and everything else, I'm sorry, I said again, a little wildly, and only too aware of the irony, I don't want to die, you know? Yes, he said again. This time I heard the pause as one of those you're not going to like this pauses. Bo is looking for me too, he said. When he finds me, he will be careful to destroy me. Last time was theatrics. This time he will take no chances. Well, that was the most cheering news I'd heard all week. Even better than ghastly revelations about the possible truth of my genetic composition. No one really understands genetics any more than anyone really understands world economics, and what I'd been guessing might not be true. I could just worry about it for the rest of my life. If I was going to have a rest of my life. As guaranteed bad news, Vampires are much sure a bet. Great. Spartan. Let's have a party. Oh, I said carefully. I looked into what was probably a short, bleak future, and realized that one of the reasons I'd been glad to see that dark shape in the chair was that with him here. For the first time since I'd come home after those nights at the lake I'd felt maybe, not totally clueless and overwhelmed. Yes, he'd been the one shackled to the ballroom wall with me, but they'd been afraid of him. Twelve against one, and him chained to the wall, and they were afraid. The fact that they'd caught him could have been some kind of trick. It happened. Presumably among vampires too. And now he was saying that he was out of his depth too. That it was hopeless. I wanted some nice human equivocation and denial. No, no, it'll be all right. The table knife was an ugly accident. And by the way you're not going to morph into an axe murderer. Rescuing the odd vampire from destruction had already fulfilled my bad gene quota of antisocial behavior. Please. Why does he hate you so much? I said. The silence went on for a while, but I could wait. What else was there to do? Walk outside and shout, here I am. I might be due for a short, squalid future, but as a basic principle I was going to hold on to what there was of it. He hadn't refused to answer yet. It's a long story, he said at last. We are nearly the same age. There are different ways of being what we are. Mine is one way. His is another. Mine, it turns out, has certain advantages. If others perhaps thought the implications through, some things might be different. Bo does not wish anyone to think those implications through. Destroying me is a way to erase the evidence. Plus that he does not care for me to have advantages no longer available to him. 
This was interesting, and under other circumstances would have made me curious. Constantine couldn't be very old, by vampire standards only young vampires can go out in strong moonlight, like tonight. Middle-aged ones can go out when the moon is young or old enough. Later middle-aged ones can only go outdoors when there is no moon. Really old ones can't be outdoors under the open sky at all, with any possibility of the dimmest reflected sunlight touching them. That was one of the reasons older ones began running gangs. If they survived to be old they'd also developed other powers. He has another urgent reason, now. If he does not destroy me, he will lose control of his gang. Bo likes ruling. It is also necessary to him that he rule, to do with those advantages I possess and he does not. And while as the leader of his gang he is much more powerful than I am, alone, I am the stronger. And you don't run a gang, I said. No. I thought of saying, so, what now, do we hold hands and jump? How long a fall can a vampire walk away from? How high do we have to climb first? A mere almost human pretty reliably goes splat after about four stories, I think. I was beginning to feel sorry that he'd come. No. I'd rather jump out a window and get it over with fast than fall into Bo's clutches again. I was merely resisting the idea that jumping was my best choice. I have thought of it a good deal, these last weeks, he was saying, for I knew what happened at the lake would not be the end. Not with Bo. I also know that singly you and I have no chance. I do wish you'd stop saying that, I thought. But together, he continued, we may have a chance. It is not a good chance, but it is a chance. I do not like it. You cannot like it. I do not understand what it is that you do, and have done. I am not sure we will be able to work together, even if we attempt it. Even if we are each other's only chance. He was sitting in the darkness beyond the moonlight, and I could not see his face. I could a little see movement as he spoke, vampires also speak by moving their mouths. But this conversation was a little too like talking to a figment of your own imagination. Your darkest, spookiest, most bottom of your unconscious where the monsters lurk imagination. Even the shadow in the chair was half imaginary. No it wasn't. There's really no mistaking the presence of a vampire in the room. Will you help me, he said. It is very peculiar being asked a life or death question in a tone of voice that has no tone in it. Emotionally speaking the response feels like it ought to be something like passing the salt or closing the door. Oh, I said intelligently. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, well. Yes. Certainly. Since you put it so persuasively. There was a pause, and then there was a brief noise that mercifully also briefly, unhinged my spine. He had laughed. Forgive my persuasiveness, he said. I would spare you if I could. I do not wish this any more than you do. No, I said thoughtfully. I don't suppose you do. If I'd been honest I suppose what I'd really wanted him to do was say, 
Oh, don't worry about it. This is vampire business and I'll take care of it. Dream on. So, I said. I didn't want to know, but I guessed I should make an effort. What do we do now? We start, he said, and paused. I recognized this as the middle of an unfinished sentence, and not one of his cryptic pronouncements, and waited. Then there was a funny breathing noise that I translated provisionally as a sigh. Vampires don't breathe right, why should they sigh right? But maybe it means vampires can feel frustration. Noted. We start by my trying to discover what assistance I can give you. Somehow this didn't sound like the usual movie adventure sort of I'll keep you covered while you reload assistance. What do you mean? We must face Bo at night. Your abilities would not get us past the guards that protect his days. I didn't even consider asking what those guards might be. Humans are at great disadvantage at night. I think I may be able to grant you certain dispensations. Dispensations. I like that. Vampire as fairy godmother. Or godfather. Pity he couldn't dispense me from getting killed. You mean like being able to see in the dark or something? Yes. I mean exactly that. Oh. If I could see in the dark I would never again have to trip over the threshold of the bathroom door on the way to have a pee at midnight. If I lived long enough to need to. I will have to touch you, he said. Okay, I told myself. He's not going to forget himself and eat me because he comes a few feet closer. I thought of the second night in the ballroom, sit a little distance from the corner, yes, nearer me. Remember that three feet more or less makes no difference to me, you might as well. And he'd carried me something like four to five miles. And only about the first four to two of them had been in daylight. And somehow pointing out that I now was in bed and wearing nothing but a nightgown and would like to get up and put some clothes on first, please, was worse than not mentioning my inappropriate for receiving visitors state of undress. So I didn't mention it. Okay, I said. That fluid, in human motion again, as he stood up and stepped toward me. I'd forgotten that too, forgotten how strange it is. How ominous. Too fluid for anything human. For anything alive. He sat down near me on the bed. The bed dipped, as if from ordinary human weight. I pulled my feet up and turned toward him, but I did it carelessly, more conscious of him than of anything else which is to say, more carelessly than I had learned to move over the last two months, carelessly so that the gash on my breast didn't just seep a little, but cracked open along its full length, as if it were being cut into me for the first time. I couldn't help it, it hurt, I gave a little gasp. And he hissed. It was a terrifying noise, and I had slammed myself back into the pillows and headboard before I had a chance to think anything at all, to think that I couldn't get away from him even if I wanted to, to think that he had declared us allies. To think that there might be any other reason for a sound like that one but that he was a vampire and I was alive and streaming with fresh blood. Stop, 
he said in what passed for his normal voice. I offer you no harm. Tell me about the blood on your breast. He didn't linger on the word blood. I muttered, it won't heal. It's been like this for two months. He wasn't as good at waiting as I was. Go on, he said immediately. I'd stopped shrugging in the last two months too. You can't shrug without pulling at the skin below your collarbones. I don't know. It doesn't heal. It seems to close over and then splits again. The doctor put stitches in it a couple of times, gave me stuff to put on it. Nothing works. It just splits open again. It's a nuisance but I have been kind of learning to live with it. Like I had a choice. This is, er, uh, worse than usual. Sorry. It's only a shallow gash. You may, er, uh, remember. I remember, he said. Show me. I managed not to say, what? It took me a minute to gather my dignity as well as my courage, and my hands were shaking a little when I raised them to unbutton the top two buttons of my nightgown, and peel the edges back so he could see the bony space below my collarbones and above the swell of my bosom, where the blood now ran down in a thin ragged curtain from the wicked curved mouth of the long ugly slash. I barely flinched when he reached out a hand and touched the blood with his finger and tasted it. Then I closed my eyes. I offer you no harm, he said again, gently. Sunshine. Open your eyes. I opened them. The wound is poisoned, he said. It weakens you. It is very dangerous. It was for you, I said, dreamily. I felt like one of those oracle priestesses out of some old myth, seized by some spirit not her own, a spirit that then speaks from her mouth. They wanted to poison you. Yes, he said. I thought. I have been so tired, these last two months. I have got used to that too. I have told myself it is just part of having had what happened, happen. You do not get over something like that quickly. I had told myself that was all it was. I had almost believed it. I had believed it. The cut didn't heal because it didn't heal. Poisoned. Weakening me. Killing me is what he meant. Note that vampires can also be tactful. All those hours in the sunlight, baking the thing, the hostile presence on my body. I'd known it was hostile, although I hadn't admitted it. I hadn't taken the next step of thinking poisoned. Sunlight was my element, and so I turned to sunlight. And sunlight was the only thing that did any good, and it didn't do enough. Because the wound was poisoned. That was out of some story where there would be an oracle priestess somewhere, the poisoned wound that did not heal. I'd already been wondering how I was going to get through the winter, when I couldn't lie outdoors and bake some hours every week. Been learning not to think about wondering how I was going to get through the winter. He was silent, waiting for me to finish thinking. I looked at him, glint of green eyes in the moonlight. Don't look in their eyes, I thought. Tiredly. This would have been a nasty shock to him too, of course. 
finding out his ally is a goner. I was too tired to look at him. I was too tired for almost anything. Sometimes it is better not to know. Sometimes when you do know you just fold up. Sunshine. I know a little about poisons. This is not something your human doctors can distill an antidote for. This was even better than his repeating that neither of us had any chance against Bo. By dying I was going to ruin his chances too. It's funny, I was actually sorry about this. Maybe I was a little delirious. Maybe too much had been happening lately. Maybe I was just very, very short of sleep. There is something that can be done. Can be tried. Pause. It is not easy. Oh, big surprise. Something wasn't going to be easy. I tried to rouse myself, to react. I failed. But can you trust me? More happy news. Not just something to be done, but a vampire something. Which doubtless meant it would have more blood in it. I don't like blood. I mean, I like it fine, inside, circulating, carrying oxygen and calories to all your stay-at-home cells, but slimy seeping pink hamburger gives me the whim-whams. Can you trust me, he said. Not will you. Can you? Good question. I thought about it. It will not be easy. Yes, okay, that was a given. I didn't have to think about that. Can I trust him? What have I got to lose? What if his something is something I can't bear? There are all sorts of things I can't bear. I'm not brave to begin with, I'm very, very tired, I'm spongy with post-traumatic what have you, and I very nearly can't bear what I did last night with a table knife. And I may be a homicidal maniac. Yes, I said. Yes. I think so. He didn't exhale a long breath, as a human might have done, but he went motionless instead. It was a different kind of motionlessness than not moving. Having said yes I felt better. Less tired. Evidently still delirious, however, because I bent toward him, touched the back of his hand. Okay. I said. A little silence. Okay, he said. I had the sudden irreverent notion that he'd never said okay before. Spend time with humans and have all kinds of unusual experiences. Laughter. Slang. It will not be tomorrow night, he said. Perhaps the night after. Okay, I said. See you. Sleep well, he said. Oh, sure, absolutely, I said, trying for irony, but he was already gone. I left the window full open. I wanted as much of the fresh night air in the room with me as possible. There was a tiny chiming from one of the window charms. It was a curiously serene and hopeful noise. I must have looked pretty rough that morning too. It occurred to me that everybody at the coffee house was treating me like an invalid while trying to pretend they weren't treating me like an invalid. I wanted to tell them that they were right, 
I was an invalid, that mark on my breast that only Mel knew was still there was poisoned, and I was dying. I didn't say any of this. I said I was still short of sleep. Pal I turned up an hour before time that morning saying he didn't have anything better to do, but I was pretty sure mom had called him and asked if he could come in early. I think mom had figured out that the charms she was giving me were going somewhere like into the Rex glove compartment, so she had begun stashing them around the bakery where maybe I wouldn't find them but they could still do me some good. Since my unwelcome speculations about dark family secrets the other night in Jess's office I had begun to wonder what all mom's charms were for, exactly. She's always been something of a charm freak, I'd put it down to eight years in my dad's world. I found two new ones that morning. A little curled up animal of some sort with its paws over its eyes and a red bead where its navel should have been, and a shiny white disc that rainbows ran across if you held it up against the light. I left them where I found them. Maybe I should let them try to defend against whatever they could. I had some fellow feeling for the small curled up creature with its hands over its face even if the red alien parasite was lower down on it than it was on me. Charms are often noisy, which is another reason I don't like them much, but you aren't going to hear extraneous buzzing and burbling above the general din at Charlie's. Especially on shifts when I had to spend some time in the company of a genially humming apprentice. Mel was working that afternoon but Emil had the day off from the library. She wandered back into the bakery with a cup of coffee toward the end of my stint, said she'd just found out about an old books and junk sale in Redtree, which was one of the little towns between us and the next big city to the south. She was going to go, and did I want to come along? I should probably have gone home and taken a nap but I didn't want to. So I said yes. A nice little outing for the doomed. Furthermore Emil talked about library politics the whole way there and didn't once mention nocturnal neighborhood excitements. So by the time we arrived at the village square in Red Tree I was in the mood. Ordinarily I love this kind of thing without any effort. Someone who does coffee house baking for a living doesn't have huge amounts of disposable income, but the point about books and junk sales is that you never know what you may find for hilariously cheap. There are fewer people since the wars than there had been before, and less money, don't ask me how this works. You'd think if there were fewer people there would be more money to go around, so there is a lot less motive for dealers to discover specialist markets for old, beat up, weird, or obscure looking and possibly other related stuff. Plus a lot of people don't want to think about old, beat up, weird, obscure looking, and possibly other related stuff because it reminds them of the wars or what life had been like before the wars, i.e., better. The result is that a lot of very interesting non-junk gets heaved into the nearest box for the next garage sale. Furthermore, almost nobody wants to read the gormless old fiction about the others which is my fave. I picked up a copy of Sordid Enchantments on the title alone, and the fourth, and most icky and rare, volume of the Dark Blood series, which I was no longer sure I wanted to read, the heroine has a choice to die horribly or become a vampire horribly, and she chooses to die. If I'd realized how gross it was going to get after the first volume I wouldn't have bothered but I'm a completist, I had the first three, and hey. I was feeling pretty good.
in spite of last night, or in an even funnier way, because of it. It was like I had two days out of time. Everything was on hold until either the vampire something worked, or it didn't. Jesse and Theo had been at a table under the awning when Emil and I left Charlie's, and I'd nodded and kept going. I hoped nothing had come up they wanted to talk to me about. Nothing was allowed to come up for the next two days. I was on vacation in my own mind, cinnamon rolls at 4 a.m. or not. It must have been Paulie's influence, but I was positively humming a tune an old folk song about keeping a vampire talking till sunrise, not one of your brighter vampires, while I burrowed through a big sagging cardboard box of junk. Chipped china teacups. Dented tin trays. Small splintery wooden boxes with lids that no longer closed. A bottle opener shaped like a dragon with an extremely undershot lower jaw and pink glass eyes. Pink. The Dragon Anti-Defamation Society should hear about this. At the bottom, when I touched it, it fizzled right through me, like I'd put my arm in a cappuccino machine. I knew it had to be some kind of ward, non-warding charms are kind of stickier, but a live ward shouldn't be in the bottom of a box of cheap junk at a garage sale. Maybe it had fallen out of one of the splintery boxes. I hesitated, then picked it up to get a better look. Gingerly. It had now got my attention, so presumably it wouldn't feel the need to scramble my arm like an egg again. I didn't recognize the style or the design. It was an oval, not quite the length of the palm of my hand, with a slightly raised edge, the whole of it thick and heavy, like an old coin, before the mints got mean and started stamping out pennies that sometimes bent if you dropped them edgewise on a hard floor. It was silver, I thought, or plate, it was so tarnished I couldn't make out clearly what was on it, except that something was. Three somethings, one each on top, middle, and bottom, rather like an old Egyptian glyph. The only thing I could say for sure was that they weren't any of the standard other preventive sigils I knew of, nor the all-purpose circle star and cross one. The most interesting thing was that it was live. Very live. Wards aren't necessarily as master-specific as most charms, and if they aren't actively in use they can molder quietly for a long time and still be capable of being wakened and doing some warding but even one that's been tuned to you specifically shouldn't leap avidly out at you and wag its tail like a dog wanting to go for a walk. I could have put it back. I could have taken it to someone in charge and said you've made a mistake. This one still works. But I didn't. It seemed to like lying there in my hand. Don't be ridiculous. I thought. It's not responding to me personally. As a soldier in the dented tin tray army they shouldn't be expecting real money for it, but that could only be because they hadn't noticed it was live. It was still worth a try. I took the two books and the tarnished ward to the suspicious looking character at the card table with the rusty money box who snatched them out of my hands as if he knew I was trying something on. But he was so preoccupied with whether or not he should sell me Altar of Darkness, in which it takes the heroine 400 pages to die, which was certainly worth more than the 17 blinks for two, which is what the sign on the drooping book table said, that he barely registered my little glyph. 
I'd done piously outraged innocence when he started haranguing me about Alter and a few of his other customers scowled at him and muttered about fairness. I won that round. So. When he looked at the glyph and said 50 blinks I sniffed so he would know that I knew he was a brigand and a bandit, and let it pass. He knew more about books. Even a dead ward made out of silver plate was worth more. A blink is a dollar, and has been since after the wars, when our economy went to pieces, and the average paycheck disappeared in the blink of an eye. What was more interesting was that he'd touched the glyph and hadn't said wow. That was like putting my hand in a cappuccino machine. Emil had been watching my performance with a straight face. Well done, she said, when we got back to the car. Dark blood for us two for seventeen blinks. Zora will be mad with jealousy. Now what is that little thing? I was balancing my glyph on the top of the books, and I watched as she picked it up. That Mr. Rusty Money Box hadn't registered anything was one thing, if Emil didn't register either it was something else. She didn't say anything about a feeling like having her funny bone hit with a hammer. Hem. It's quite appealing, isn't it? Even all blackened like this. Appealing. Maybe it had decided that making people's hair stand on end wasn't such a good way of making friends and influencing people. Can you figure out any of what's on it? She frowned, turning it this way and that in the light. No clue. Maybe after you get it polished. Dessert shift that night was notable only for the number of people who wanted cherry tarts. They were catching on. Rats. I didn't really like little electrical gadgets, most of the other so-called home bakeries in town used kneading machines, for example, which I thought beneath contempt, but there was no way I was going to be making cherry tarts without one. I'd already said I would only make individual tarts and customers had to order them with the main course to give me enough lead time. And they were still catching on. I didn't want cherry tarts to turn into another death of Marat. When I was first installed in my new bakery and messing around with the heady implications of Charlie's having built it for me. I'd been having fun with puddings that look like one thing and you stick a fork in them and they become something else. A gothic sensibility in the bakery is not necessarily a good thing. I'd made this light fluffy looking number in a white oval dish with high sides and presented the first one with a flourish to a group of regulars who had volunteered to be experimented on. Emil was the one with the knife, and she stuck it in and the raspberry and black currant filling had exploded down the side and over the edge of the dish onto the counter. It was, I admit, a trifle dramatic. Gods, sunshine, what is this, the death of Marat, she said. Emil reads too much. Everybody at Charlie's that night wanted a taste, and the death of Marat, the first of sunshine soon to be notorious, implausibly named Epic Creations, was born, although I think most of our clientele thought Marat was some kind of master vampire. Emil is good at names. She's responsible for Tweedle Dumplings and Glutton's Grail and Buttermost Limit too. The problem is that for months after I was getting constant requests for the damn thing, and light, fluffy puddings with heavy fillings are a brute to make. 
Our long-time regulars still ask for it occasionally, but I'm older and meaner now and say no better. I will make it if I like you enough. Maybe. Well, the cherry season doesn't last long around here. I'd be back to apple pie before Billet had time to miss doing the peeling. Unless I found some other source of cheap child labor I might have to get an electric peeler in another year. It was true that Charlie's did almost everything from scratch and that anything that one of us wasn't good at didn't get done at all, but it was also true that our loyal customers were compelled to be biddable. If I decided I didn't feel like doing cherry tarts outside of fresh cherry season they could like it or eat at fast burgers or us. When I got home I fished last night's sheets and nightgown out of the tub where they'd been soaking the bloodstains out, just like the death of Marat without Marat, hauled them downstairs, and stuffed them in the washing machine. If Yolanda had noticed the amount of laundry I'd been doing in the last two months she never said anything. Sunshine Chapter 12 I put altar and sordid enchantments on one of the hip-high piles of books to read next in the corner of the living room, and got out the silver polish. Not standard equipment in my household. I'd bought some before I came home. The glyph came up beautifully. Except I still couldn't make out the figures. It was weirdly heavy for plate. And doesn't plate tend to look platy when you've shined it up? Maybe I only knew cheap plate. Even so. The symbol at the top was round with snaky and spiky lines woven through it. The symbol at the bottom was narrow at the base and fat at the top. The one in the middle might conceivably have four legs, which would presumably make it some kind of animal. Right. Two squiggles and an unknown animal. The top squiggle could be a symbol for the sun. The bottom squiggle could be a symbol for a tree. And if it was solid silver, even if the round squiggle wasn't the sun and the fat on the top squiggle wasn't a tree, it was still a shoe in as an anti-other ward. None of the others liked silver. Whatever it was, looking at it made my spirits lift. For someone under two death threats, plus, I suppose, the incompatible threats of Pat and Jess's idea of what my future should include, supposing I had a future, because, if I did, I would spend it incarcerated in a small padded room, this was good enough. I put it in the drawer in the little table next to my bed. I slept that night, you should forgive the term, the sleep of the dead. So when the alarm went off I was almost ready to get up. The prospect of the night to come started to creep up on me almost immediately, but there were distractions, Mr. Cagney complained that his roll didn't have enough cinnamon filling at 7am, Pauli called at 7.15 with a head cold, and Kenny dropped a tray of dirty plates at 7.30. He'd been doing better since Meld had his word, but he'd decided he'd rather do the early hours than the late ones, and this was only going to work if he got home sooner to do his homework sooner to get to bed sooner. Not my problem. Except in terms of Liz spending time helping to clean the floor instead of unloading cookie trays and muffin tins for me. Pat came in about mid-morning and penetrated my flowery lair. Thought you'd like to know the girl from the other night. She's come round. She doesn't remember a thing from the time the sucker spoke to her to waking up in the hospital the next morning. 
She doesn't remember the guy was a sucker. And she's fine. A little spooked, but fine. Translation, the only on-the-spot witness doesn't remember what she saw, or at least isn't saying anything. And Jesse and Theo, who are claiming the strike for SOF, you don't kill vampires, of course, although most of us civvies use the term, in SOF speak you strike them, were there only seconds after me and before anyone else. Except maybe Mrs. Bielowski. But it was one of those days when the coffee house schedule breaks down, and Charlie and Mel and Mom and I held the pieces together with our teeth. We always have at least one of these days during a seven-day, or thirteen-day, depending on how you're counting, week. Not to mention the prospect of getting up at 3 4 to 5 on Thursday. During a 13 day week. My sense of occult oppression tightened anyway, but it had its work cut out for it. I had 4 to 5 minutes off from 10 4 to 5 to 11 30, between the usual morning baking and the beginning of the lunch rush, and almost an hour off at 3 30 while a skeleton staff got us through the late afternoon muffin and scone crowd, before the more gradual dinner swell began, plus two or three tea with elective aspirin breaks. I went home at nine. Anyone who wanted dessert after that could have ginger pound cake or Indian pudding or chocoholia. It wasn't a night for individual fruit tarts. Fortunately I was tired enough to sleep. Before I'd found out I was going to be working all day I had thought I wouldn't sleep at all. By the time I got home I knew I'd sleep, but assumed I'd get a couple of hours and be awake by midnight, waiting for something to happen. I'd spent some time considering what I should, you know, where. This vampire in the bedroom thing was a trifle more intensively perturbing than this vampire around at all thing. Even if the disconcertingness was only happening in my mind. There was a corollary to the story about male suckers being able to keep it up indefinitely, that you had to, er, uh, invite them over that threshold first too. But if they could seduce you into dying just by looking at you, then they could probably perform other seductions as well. Okay, this particular vampire had declined to seduce me to death when he could have. This was a good omen as far as it went. I reminded myself that the sound of his laughter made me want to throw up, and that in sunlight he looked well, dead. Let's get real here. I couldn't possibly be interested in. I involuntarily remembered that sense of vampire in the room. It wasn't like the pheromone haze when your eyes lock with someone else's across a room, crowded or otherwise, and wham. It really was not at all like that. But it was more like that than anything else I could think of. It probably had something to do with the peak experience business, with a vampire in the room you are sitting there expecting to die. Sex and death, right? Peak experiences. And since I didn't go in for any of the standard neck-risking pastimes I didn't have a lot of practical knowledge of the hormone rush you get when you may be about to snuff it. Perhaps someone who loved free-fall parachuting or shark wrestling would find vampires in the room less troubling. Never mind. Let's leave it that vampires infesting your private spaces are daunting. And one of the ways to stiffen a uh, boost morale is to wear carefully selected for the occasion morale boosting clothing. I went to bed wearing my oldest, 
most faded flannel shirt, the bra that had looked all right in the catalogue but was obviously an escapee from a downmarket nursing home when it arrived, white cotton panties that had had pansies on them about 700 washings ago and were now a kind of mottled grey, and the jeans I usually wore for house cleaning or raking Yolanda's garden because they were too shabby for work even if I never came out of the bakery. Food inspector arrest on site jeans. Oh, and fuzzy green plaid socks. It was a cool night for summer. Relatively. I lay down on top of the bedspread. And slept through till the alarm at 3.45. He hadn't come. That was not one of my better days at work. I snarled at everyone who spoke to me, and snarled worse when no one snarled back. Mel, who would have, wasn't there. Mom, fortunately, didn't have time to get into a furious argument with me, so we shot a few salvos over each other's bows, and retired to our separate harbours. We did try to stay out of each other's way but it wasn't like Mon to avoid a good blazing row with her daughter when one was offered. What had she been guessing while I'd been doing my guessing? There was quite a lot in the literature of bad crosses about petty, last straw exasperations that tipped the balance. I'd been checking Globenet archives when I could have been reading sordid enchantments. I'm not a goddamn invalid. I howled at Charlie. I don't need to be treated with gloves and, and bedpans. Will you please tell me I'm being a miserable bitch and you'd like to append a garbage bin over my head? There was a pause. Well, the idea had crossed my mind, said Charlie. I stood there. Buttery fists clenched, breathing hard. Thank you, I said. Anything you want to talk about? Charlie said in his best offhand manner. I thought about it. Charlie ambled over and closed the bakery door. Doors don't get closed much at the coffee house, so when one is, You'd better not open it for anything less than a coachload of tourists who didn't book ahead, have four to five minutes for lunch before they meet their guide at the other museum, which is a 15-minute coach ride away, it's only seven minutes on foot, but try to convince a coachload of tourists of that, they all want burgers and fries and won't look at the menu, we're not heavily into burgers so our grill is kind of small and we don't do fries at all, except on special, when they're not what burger eaters would call fries anyway. This really happened once, and by the time mom got through with that tour company the president was on his knees, offering her conciliatory free luxury cruises for two in the Caribbean or at least all future meal bookings of his tour groups when they came to New Arcadia, made well in advance. She accepted the latter, and the Earth Trek Touring Company, the president's name is Benjamin Sisko, but I bet that wasn't the one he was born with, and you should see the logo on their coaches, was now one of our best customers. We could almost retire on what they brought us in August. And we taught his regular tour leaders how to find the other museum on foot. This made the coach drivers love us too. This is not what the city council had in mind when they were drooling over the prospect of seeing new Arcadia on the new post walls map. But the other museum is why coachloads of the kind of tourists who sign up with a company called Earth Trek now come to New Arcadia. The public exhibits are still lowest common denominator, 
but there are more of them than there used to be, and the gal attack simulation is supposed to be especially good, yucko, I say. We do also have a few more prune-faced academics on teeny stipends renting rooms in Old Town, but it's nowhere as bad as I'd feared. The proles win again. Ha! Charlie ambled back from closing the door and sat on the stool in the corner. It wasn't so hot a day that we were going to die of being in the bakery with the ovens on and the door closed to at least ten minutes. Because of the other night, I said, the SOF guys want me to be a kind of unofficial SOF guy. Charlie said carefully, I didn't think a table knife was usual. I sighed. What did you think? when you followed me out there that night. Just that I'd lost my mind. Charlie considered this before he answered. I thought something had snapped, yes. I didn't think it was your mind, but I didn't have much time to think. By the time I got there it was all over. And I guess I realized then that I'd, we'd, had the wrong end of the, table knife all along. Since I disappeared for a couple of days. Yeah. It had to be the others, one way or another. Sorry. It just, the way you were, you didn't want to talk to any cops, but you really didn't want to talk to SOF. I hadn't thought it was that noticeable. You were okay with the rest of us at Charlie's, us humans, not just us, strangers too. Navi like something really bad had happened, which we already knew, but okay. Anyone, you know, pretty human. Except TV reporters. If they were human. It wasn't worse because you were here on full moon nights like usual, after. And they don't usually go around biting people except at the full moon. And however fidgety and whimsical I'd felt, I wouldn't have driven out to the lake alone on a full moon night. There are some was out there. Just like there are a few was in Old Town. More than a few. It doesn't hurt to be nice to them, they'll remember that you were, the other 29 days of the month. Unlike suckers, who tend to prefer the urban scene, the was you really want to avoid mostly hang out in the wilderness. And sorry, since you didn't have any visible pieces missing it couldn't be zombies or gals. I was the other expert at Charlie's. Most of the staff didn't want to know, like most of the human population didn't want to know, and our SOFs were just customers who wore too much khaki. Mel said stories about the others made his tattoos restless. Sadie and I thought it must be some kind of demon. Sadie well. Sadie talked to a couple of those specialist shrinks you wouldn't talk to, and they said this stuff can be as traumatic as it gets, and to leave you alone about it if you didn't want to talk. I wish that was the only reason for the charms and the uncharacteristic reserve. Maybe it was. Or maybe I could make it be all. I was my mother's daughter, after all. Maybe I had hidden depths of Attila the Hunness. I said cautiously, did she tell them about my dad? Charlie shook his head. I'd nearly forgotten about your dad myself, till the other night. 
It had never seriously occurred to me that what happened to you had anything to do with vampires. Ah, people don't get away from vampires. Any more than people get rid of vampires with table knives. Even Charlie knew that much. Yeah. That's what the SOFs say too. Charlie was silent a minute. I was thinking, if Charlie had forgotten about my dad then he must not be a part of the bad crosswatch. My mother had never told him about great-great-aunt Margaret, who had a limp because her left foot was short, horny, and cloven. Or whoever great-aunt Margaret had been and whatever demon mark they'd had. I mean mom was keeping her fears to herself. I told you she was brave, she'd let her parents cut her off to marry my dad, she'd taken on the blazes single-handed when she left him. Any sensible woman who was not Attila the Hun in a previous existence would have been more than justified in leaving me behind for my dad's family to cope with. And they would have, if I had gone bad they might have denied I was theirs, but they'd have coped. And if I had gone bad, they'd V wanted to be there, performing damage control, for their sake if not mine. So she'd been doubly brave, or foolhardy. And there may not have been very many blazes. Left before the wars but they were formidable. Some demons are very tough. Tougher than any human. Although the tough ones also tend to be the stupid ones. Charlie said, what do you want to do? Go on making cinnamon rolls, I said instantly. Charlie smiled faintly. That's what I want to hear, of course. Is it? I said. Do you want someone so, so obviously, not just some kind of freak magic handler but someone who, someone who I mean with vampires, do you want someone like this, like me making your cinnamon rolls? Yes, said Charlie. Yes. You make the best cinnamon rolls, probably in the history of the world. Never mind all the rest of it. We pay taxes for SOF to take care of the others. We need you here. If you want to be here. I don't care who your dad is. Or what else you can do with a table knife. I looked at him. He'd have every right to fire my ass. Humans don't like weird magic handlers on the cooking staff of their restaurants. But I was a member of this family, this clan, a member of the bizarre community that was Charlie's. A key member even. I owed it to these people not to go mad. With or without an axe. And to stay alive. Charlie's Coffee House, Old Town's peculiar little beacon in the encroaching darkness. An interesting perspective on current events. That's all right then, I said. Good. Charlie opened the door again and ambled out. I went to bed wearing jeans and a flannel shirt again that night. I woke at midnight and stumbled into the bathroom for a pee, tripping over the sill on the way. I went back to bed and fell asleep again immediately. The alarm went off at 3.45. He hadn't come. The sense of outrage of the day before, the absurd sense of having been stood up like a teenager on her way to the prom, was gone, as if it were a candle flame that had been blown out. I was worried. 
The fact that the wound on my breast, for the past four days, since he'd told me it was poisoned, was burning like the fur had set a match to my skin, was almost by the way. It was as if now that I had the diagnosis I didn't care what the diagnosis was, knowing was enough. For a few days. It was seeping so badly I not only had to keep it bandaged, I had to change the gauze pad at least once a day. I didn't care. I did it and didn't think about it. The heavy, permanent sense of tiredness made this easier than it might have been if I'd been sharp and alert. The only problem was finding places to put the adhesive tape that weren't already sore from having adhesive tape there too often already. I could have bought the surgical tape that doesn't take your skin off with it, but that would have been admitting there was a problem. I wasn't admitting anything. So the area around the slash looked peeled. The thing that really wasn't all right was that he'd said he'd be back, and he wasn't. Things are getting bad if I was worried about a vampire. Well, they were bad, and I was worried. I didn't see him as the stand-you-up kind. If you could apply human guidelines to a vampire, which you couldn't. But if he'd said he'd be back, he'd be back. I was sure. And he wasn't. I had the rest of the day off after I finished the morning baking. Paoli, still hoarse but no longer sneezing came in and started on lemon lechery and marbled brown sugar cake, and I went home to comb every Globenet account I could find on vampire activity. Because of my peculiar hobby I paid for a line into the Cosworld better than most home users bothered with, so I didn't have to go to the library every time I wanted the hottest new reportage on the others. If there was anything to find I should be able to find it. When some big vampire feud came to a head there was usually more than enough mayhem to alert even the dimmest of the news media. And maybe this was only a tiny, local feud, but our media aren't among the dimmest. I couldn't believe that, this time, knowing what he knew, he wouldn't sell himself dearly if Bo had caught him again. If, that is, he hadn't come back because he'd been prevented. If I hadn't been stood up like a teenager going to the prom with a known loser. One might almost say a deadbeat. Ha ha. I couldn't find anything. After I looked through all the local stuff I started on the national, and then the international. The nearest report of anything like what I thought I might be looking for was happening in Macedonia. I didn't think it would happen in Macedonia. I wanted to start looking up glyphs, to see if I could translate mine, but I couldn't make myself be interested enough. I cleaned the apartment instead. I rearranged the piles of books to be read immediately. Altar of Darkness went on the bottom, although I dusted it first. I mopped floors. I scrubbed sinks. I baking soded the tea stains out of the teapot and my favorite mugs. I vacuumed. I folded laundry. I even cleaned a few windows. I hate cleaning windows. I was too tired to work this hard but I couldn't sit still. And it was overcast outdoors, not a day that insisted I go out and lie in it. By evening I was exhausted and slightly queasy. I had an egg and romaine sandwich on two slabs of my pumpernickel bread at six, and went to bed at seven. I gave up. 
I wore the nightgown I'd been wearing for nights ago, and got between the sheets. I had a little trouble going to sleep, but it was as if my thoughts were spinning so fast or maybe it was effect of the poison winning at last eventually I got dizzy and fell over into unconsciousness. When I woke up three hours later he was there. Darkness, sitting in my bedroom chair. Darkness, I noticed, barefoot. I couldn't remember if he'd been barefoot the other night or not. I sat up. I was too sleepy and too relieved not tell the truth. I've been worrying about you. I'd figured out last time that vampires don't move when they're startled, they go stiller. He did that different kind of stillness thing. You know, I said. Concern. Unease. Anxiety. You said you'd come back two nights ago. You didn't. There's this little threat of annihilation going on too, you know? I thought maybe you'd got into trouble. The preparations took longer than I anticipated, he said. That is all. Nothing to worry you. Nothing to worry me, I said, warming to my theme. Sure. The annihilation threat includes me and I'm wearing a poisoned wound that is slowly killing me. I wouldn't dream of worrying about anything. Good, he said. Worry is useless. Oh, I began. I, I stopped. Okay. You win. Worry is useless. He stood up. I tried not to clutch the bedclothes into a knot. He pulled his shirt off and dropped it on the floor. Ekeek. He sat on the edge of my bed again. He had one leg folded under him and the other foot still on the floor, sitting to face me cringing into the headboard. I thought, okay, okay, he still has one foot on the floor. And he only took his shirt off. Do you still have the knife you transmuted, he said. That would be the best. The best what? I knew this was going to have blood in it. I knew I wasn't going to like it. And that particular knife, of course, ah. Uh, well, yes, I still have it. I didn't move. Show me, he said. A human might have said, what's your problem? So where is it? He just said, show me. I opened the bedside table drawer. When my jeans went in the wash, the contents of my pockets went in there. The knife was there. It was lying next to the glyph as if they were getting to know each other. The light was visible at once in the darkness. I picked the knife up and cradled it in my hand, a tiny, clement sun that happened to look like a pocket knife. In ordinary daylight or good strong electric light it still looked like a pocket knife. I held it out toward him. This has been since that night. Yes. It happened, do you remember, right at the end, I transmuted it again, into the key to my door. Yes. I'm pretty sure that's when it happened. It had been something in the dark colored when I pulled it out. I don't, it was something to do with making the change at night, I think. 
I think I'm not supposed to be able to do stuff after dark. But I did do it. I felt something, crack. Snap. In me. And since then it's been like this. I shifted it back to a knife the next day, didn't notice till evening what had happened. I thought it would fade after a while, but it hasn't. I think I'm not supposed to be able to do stuff after dark. I had done this somehow though. And I happened to have been being held in the lap of a vampire at the time. That had been another of the things I hadn't been thinking about, the last two months. Because if it was something to do with the vampire, this vampire, why had my knife become impregnated with light? I hadn't told anyone, shown anyone. It was very odd, finally having someone to tell. I hadn't wanted to tell anyone at the coffee house, any of the SOFs. When I spent the night with Mel, I was careful to keep my knife in its pocket. I was still trying to be Ray Seddon, coffee house baker, in that life. Even after I'd exposed my little secret that it had been vampires at the lake, that I was a magic handler and a transmuter, I still hadn't wanted to tell anyone about my knife. The only person, you should forgive the term, left to tell was him. The vampire. The vampire I had now agreed to ally myself with in the hopes of winning against a common enemy. It was a relief, telling someone. I wondered what else an unknown something breaking open inside me might have let loose, besides a little radiant dye leak. I wondered if the jackknife of a bad magic cross would glow in the dark. Sure. And when I went nuts it would transmute into a chainsaw. He looked at it but made no attempt to touch it. That helps to explain. One of the reasons it has taken this extra time for me to come to you is that it has puzzled me you are not weaker, having borne what you bear two months already. I have been seeking an explanation. It could be crucial to our effort tonight. He paused. When he went on, his voice had dropped half an octave or so, and it wasn't easy to hear to begin with because of the weird rough half-echo and the tonelessness. What you show me is a judgment on my arrogance, it did not occur to me to ask you for information. I have much to learn about working with anyone, for all that I believed I had thought through what I said to you last time. I ask pardon. I gaped at him. Oh please. Like I'm not sitting here half expecting you to change your mind and eat me. Oh, sorry, I forgot, I'm poisonous, I suppose I'm safe after all, I get to bite the big one without your help. I'm your little friend the deadly nightshade. But that's just it, humans and vampires don't ally. We're implacable enemies. Like cobras and mongooses. Mongoose. Why should you have thought of asking me anything? If there is going to be pardoning between us, it should be for lunacy and mutual. At least he didn't laugh. Very well. We shall learn together. Speaking of learning, I said. I take it you have learned what to do about this, and I gestured toward my breast. Since you're here. I have learned what will work, if anything will. And what if it doesn't work? Then both of us end our existence tonight, 
He said in that impassive weary chain to the wall and the bad guys are coming voice I remembered too well.